Right, so managing weeds. Lots of people are having issues or they think they're having issues with weeds this year after all the rain that we've had. Um, so firstly, what is a weed? How is it defined? There are lots and lots of definitions, but basically it's any kind of plant in an undesirable location at a particular time. So, I mean, a weed could be like your favourite piece of like um, plant, but if it's taken over your front lawn, you don't want it there. Well, it's probably a weed. Um, tonight, I want to see if I can change your mindset about weeds because there's a lot of people, well, most people think that weeds are really, really, really bad and we want to do our best and use as most, the most poisons we can to get rid of them. So let's see how I go. Oh, yeah. I just touched that. I was trying to get rid of a bug, but anyway. Um, so what I'm trying to get across tonight is that weeds aren't always bad. Um, weeds usually grow in areas where there is a mineral lacking or in abundance. Uh, so they're, they're there for a reason. They don't just come up because they want to make our lives hell. Uh, and they are usually there because they need to repair the soil. I'm going to try and here we go, get rid of that so I can see all of my slideshow. Minimise it. There we go. That's even better. Um, okay, so in your in your paddocks, uh, whether you've got larger or small paddocks or your front yard or something like that, have you ever noticed an abundance of a particular colour of weeds in an area, um, or in a particular year or a particular time of year? I know probably a couple of years ago, all of my paddocks had um, purple weeds, all different types of purple weeds. So that means something. I never looked into it a lot. I just, because that back then I didn't know a lot about weeds. Um, this year, I really haven't noticed a huge abundance of any particular colour. There's, there's still a few of the purple weeds around, uh, but they're not bothering me at all. I'm just leaving them there. So the, the weeds, the colours of the weeds usually indicate what is going on in the soil. It can be, like the colour can actually relate to um, a particular mineral. Say if you've got an abundance of yellow weeds, it could mean something to do with sulphur. Um, it could mean, oh, hang on, somebody, something's flashing. No? Sorry, that's just me. Ah, okay. I've only used this once before, so I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I need to, I don't know. I'll have to move that later. Um, so yeah, it could be something to do with sulfur. And when I say sulfur, it could be there is a lot of sulfur that the uh, plant is trying to process, or it could be trying to um, move the sulfur around in the ground because um, different plants, uh, trees and grasses, or mainly like weeds and trees, they can be also known as um, miners. So they can actually, send their roots down as deep as they can to mine a particular mineral and bring it up to the surface. So yeah, these the particular colours could mean that particular mineral, but weeds also can indicate uh, heaps and heaps of other things in the soil if you want to get right into it. Uh, these are just examples, high or low phosphorus, high or low nitrogen uh, or calcium. A particular type of plant may indicate low in nitrogen but high in calcium in the same plant if that plant is growing in your area. Uh, certain weeds like to grow in compacted soils, certain weeds will grow in wet soils, same as grasses. And as I say, the list goes on. You can just uh, you can Google it if you're interested. Uh, I can't remember now. I always have mind blanks. Um, weed indicators. So if you want to Google it, Google um, weed or plant soil indicators and it will come up with lists of different plants or weeds and what they'll indicate in your soil. Wrong button. Here we go. So horses um, are browsers. Lots of people think they're just grazers and they only eat grass. Well that's wrong. They're, they're browsers as well. I'm pretty sure, I don't know a lot about cattle as I've said before, but I'm pretty sure cattle are, br are browsers as well as grazers as well. If you had a horse with an unfenced paddock for you know, hundreds of acres or whatever, they could walk up to eight kilometres a day in search of grasses and the plants that they want in their diet. 
So if you left the weeds in your paddock and didn't poison them or didn't do anything with them as long as um, they're not poisonous or whatever, which we're going to get to in the next slide, uh, it's really interesting to see what the horses will actually chomp on as they walk past. I've noticed because the last few weeks I've actually been walking my horses down to their paddock, like down a laneway, not on lead ropes or anything. So they're usually walking in front of me in the morning and the afternoon. And even though they've got access to one of the best paddocks at the moment, on the way down there, there's weeds in the laneways and they'll just walk along and they'll just chomp at the random weeds. It's really, I've never ever noticed it before because I've never actually walked them down to their paddocks before. So even something that we think they're not touching, uh, or they're also going through a paddock that is severely overgrazed at the moment, but it's their access to the good paddock. And even that paddock where there's nothing in there except for weeds, they're still going in there, especially to browse on the weeds. It's very, very interesting. So by allowing them to choose what they want to eat and not just letting them have access to grass only, they're, they're, they're gonna go and look for what they feel they need. Just like if you put out uh, a lick a salt lick, um, a mineral lick, I don't know. I, I have, haven't done a lot of licks, but you know, you can put out four different types of licks and not mix them and you'll see which ones the horses will go for. Well, it's the same as the weeds. They know what weeds are gonna give them certain vitamins and minerals and they'll actually go for them. And by giving them this option, they're overall, they're gonna be healthier because they're getting what they want and what they need and they're not limited. It's just like not limiting us to rice, I suppose. Okay, so how did we get to weeds, this, all the weed problems that we've got? Okay, somebody, whoops, sorry. Just did that by accident, how do I go back? Somebody's trying to connect, share, participants. Um, I can't see anyone in there. Sorry, just hold on for one second. You are not coming up. What else did you click on the link? Right, oh, oh here we go, admit. And then I'll minimize this again. Let's wait one second for Jenny to show up. Are you there yet, Jenny? I've got this little more thing with one next to it and I don't know what it means. Chat, oh, okay. Oops. Go back. Jenny hasn't showed up yet. Are I you can there see yet? her on the video. Oh, you can see her? I can't see her. She hasn't showed up on my list. It says I've got five participants, but anyway, we'll assume Jenny's there. Okay, we'll keep going. So like I said, how did we get to this? Because if I don't keep going, we'll run out of time. Well, a lot of this happened, I'm not going to start at the top of the list, a lot of this happened this year because of the drought and we were all forced to overgraze. Um, oh, hello, you got video on. <laughs> um, so when we overgraze, we take out all the good grasses and give the weeds the best opportunity to come in. Compacted soils is another one. It actually limits the, the types of grasses and the good stuff that can grow. So only the really, really strong plants or weeds are the ones that will come through. I don't know why my phone won't go off. Uh, because the soils are compacted, it's much harder for the roots to get down uh, in, and for the, the plants to take hold. Continuous grazing leading to depleted nutrients. That's probably nearly hand in hand with overgrazing, but you can still do it in a green paddock. Like when, when you get, um, if you're getting lots of rain and you're just continuously grazing that paddock, never ever giving it a rest and never adding any kind of inputs to it. You can get weeds coming in with feed, which I think happened a lot uh, with people this year, bringing in round bales and 
whether they're bringing in seeds, that kind of stuff to feed their cattle and their horses. I, I found a huge patch of um, starbur in one patch where I had a round bale this year and there was nothing of starbur in that paddock previous. And then also disturbing the soil. So if you're gonna plow or rip or dig something up for any reason, you'll notice the first things that usually come back are weeds. And I think, I mean, I don't know all the answers, but it just seems that it gives them the best opportunity to take hold faster because like weeds are so resilient and they're, they're just, they just like to come in first and um, be the most dominant kind of plant. So, I mean, they've spent generations or thousands of years doing that. Uh, and even where I've, which we'll get to in another slide, um, where I've ripped, not knowing about any of this previously, um, because ploughing is also quite bad for the soil because when you're actually ploughing, you're turning the soil over upside down and exposing the, the, the fungi and all the um, microbiology to the, to the sun and the elements and you're killing it all off. So you're not leaving all the good stuff in the soil for your, plant, your plants and your grasses to um, thrive. So we'll go to the next one. I hope you can see that because I can't see the heading. <laughs> How do I hide that? Oh, maybe, no. Oh, back. Anyway, I'm hoping you can see the top sentence of that because I can't. So yeah, when do we need to take care of weeds? Uh, we need to take care of Poisonous weeds and prickle weeds. They're, they're the most important ones to get rid of. But I've got my own little thing that I came up with and I call it my three P weeds. This probably won't be um, relevant to everyone here because not everyone has parthenium. Hopefully you're lucky enough not to have it, but I do. So I call them the three P weeds, which are prickles, poisonous and parthenium. So if they're the types of weeds that you should do as much as you possibly can to try and control. Um, so there, there's also the three pea grasses, which I'm not gonna go into, but don't, I'm, I've made this up all, <laughs> all on my own little thing, my three pea prickles. So it's got nothing to do with the three pea grasses, which are productive, perennial and palatable grasses, which if you wanna do more into your grasses and your pastures, you can look that up. So if you don't have parthenium in your area, or even if you have a tiny little amount, or you're on a creek and it's upstream, if you find it, just try and pull it out, or, or if you have to poison it before it can um, seed, because once it takes over, it can take over acres and acres in one season, as we've discovered down the road. Now, I've just got a couple of photos here of some prickles that I actually pulled out last night. I found another patch, as I do when I go on my paddock walks most days. Um, like, this is just a, a couple that just happened to be there. So I'm just gonna show you, and you probably know most of these. This is uh, Bathurst burr. Um, usually comes up in my creeks because it must come from upstream. And you'll also notice earlier in the season, your prickle plants or your grasses or whatever will do a lot of growing before they seed. And I think that's because they're feeling quite comfortable and they think, you know, we're safe, we can put a lot of effort into growing before we send out our prickles. But then later in the season, when things just start to dry up and become stressed, they will only grow, some of them only a couple of inch high, inches high before they'll um, send their prickles out. So like I've just been a couple of days walking around and I found the same starbirds that were getting up to half a metre tall and now they're literally one to two inches tall with starbirds on them. So they um, well, they can be easier to find, but they can be harder to find. Uh, this one, I hate this one, and I only uh, found, I've found two patches in the last week. It's Mossman River Burr. Uh, quite often you get it on the coast. It's the one where if you pull off those seed heads and chuck it onto your, your friend or your enemy, they'll stick to your clothes really, really well. Um, bloody awful stuff because it 
catches on the horses on their rugs and spreads everywhere and you'll end up having a whole paddock full of this stuff if you don't try and control it too so i never i for a few years now i haven't used any poisons because i'm just trying to get away from all that bad stuff but this patch that i found last night right on dark i pulled all the plants out i could see but because it's actually grass plant and not a weed plant it's really hard to tell which grass is left there that i haven't pulled out so this is the only patch this year that I'm actually going to put poison on um, and I'm just going to poison that whole patch and then I'm going to mulch over the top in case I've left any seeds behind. Um, cobbler's peg, I'm for sure lots of lots of you have that around. My parents up in Mackay have this everywhere, absolutely everywhere and you usually spend either hours pulling it out of your socks or chucking your socks out. And this is also in my creek. Lots of my weeds are coming down the creek from upstream. Parthenium, this isn't my photo, but only two, 500 metres away, there's a whole paddock of this all upstream of me. And I've spent a long time and money and effort getting out, out of my paddocks. And my paddock is probably 98% clear of this. And I'm not looking forward to the next time the creek runs because it's gonna come down. So where, why should we leave weeds in our pastures? Simply because any ground cover is better than bare ground. Uh, I think I spoke about this uh, with our, thing, our session last week, but everything to do with your pastures and your paddock is not having bare ground. So even apart from you know, your poisonous and your prickles, if you've got some kind of weed covering there or button grass that's taken over this year, it's better to leave it there than have bare ground and let other weeds take hold. So if your grass isn't growing well, but the weeds are taking over, there are reasons for it. And it's usually to do with your soil nutrition, soil health, um, which way it's going, whether it's going bad, um, coming good, or just stale or stagnant. Um, so we have succession grasses. Uh, and they're different species of grasses that will appear when the fertility suits them. Excuse me. Low fertility uh, equals low succession grasses. Excuse me. Um, Tap-rooted plants because th they can take hold easily. Button grass is a low fertility. Kerosene, which I don't really know what that is. Windmill grass, which I've seen around here, and Indian cooch, which we've got a lot of. So Indian cooch is a not particularly, yeah, well, it's a, it's a grass and it's hated by a lot of the cattle um, property owners, but it actually is quite high in protein. So it's better than nothing, as we've said before. Medium fertility uh, in your soil, um, you'll start getting your medium succession grasses. And I have a lot of these grasses here. I've got black spear grass. I've got red natal or natal or however you pronounce it. I've got roads, but I've planted the roads. I don't have feather top roads. That's the grass you usually see on the side of the road everywhere that you go. Uh, so like I know my soils are improving by how my grasses change each year. And this year I've also got um, a few other grasses that have come through. Like I've got a few forest blue grasses and things that have come through. And another one called, not quite sure if it's Angleton or Angleton or something like that. I'll have to look it up again, but that's come through in um, leaps and bounds and it's really, really good for your horses and your cattle. So your second year grasses, like when your things start to pick up kangaroo grass, which is native to Australia, buffalo more suited to cattle than horses because it'll give them big head, panic roads and soteria. So that, that's when you, 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 your soil starts to improve a, a, a fair bit. So weeds are there to repair the soil and when some of the rep repairs are complete is when you'll start getting more improvement in your, your pastures. So the weeds that we want to get rid of, there are three methods of um, getting rid of weeds. I hope you're all there because you're all so quiet. Um, and we're at 24 minutes, so we've got 15 minutes left. Uh, manual, which is what I do. 99% kill rate because you're pulling, usually pulling out uh, the roots as well. So it's pulling by hand, um, implement or machine. Um, you can, I've seen, I've been to heaps of workshops and where they've used a bobcat and they've just simply taken the, pushed the uh, lantana off, 
you know, taken the, the lantana roots are really, really, really shallow rooted and they come out really easily. And where a lantana bush has been is usually a really high fertility soil. So once the lantana's gone, the grass should come through really well. So yeah, it's 99% kill rate. Um, like I said before, become familiar with your poisonous or prickle weeds and also the declared weeds in your area because you're actually um, obliged to do something about declared weeds. And that's kind of what the problem is with the block up around the corner. Nothing's been done about it yet. So I've been on to the council about them. Slash or remove them before they seed if you possibly can. And that's simply going out there maybe two to three weeks after rain and see what comes and then just keep doing your regular weed walks. Biological, that's the use of pathogens or insects that affect the health of the weed. Uh, there's not a lot of choice out there and if you want one of these you'd probably go and see the DPI or someone like that or if you know of a property that has this particular um, pathenium, uh, pathogen or insect go and see if you can grab some of theirs. So an example is pathenium rust or prickly pear beetle and I suppose it's also what the cane toad for um, something to do with the cane. That didn't work very well, they did it. Um, and this doesn't usually get like 100%. I don't know what the kill rate is, but it usually slows it down probably good enough for you to be able to control it. And finally, chemical, which I've, this has come up very blurry. I, I could not find my document to copy and paste this, so I've taken a photo of it. So of course, when you're using your chemicals, make sure you use all of your safety gear, please. I never used to, but the more I've learned about all this stuff, the more dangerous it really is and how it can affect you a lot later in life without you realising it. So make sure you wear all your gear. Um, also remember, you know, if you've got horses or cattle in there, whether it's going to be safe or not for them. And one method I used to do was I would, if I was poisoning in any of the paddocks, this is years ago, I wouldn't put the horses back in there at least until it had a rain to kind of rinse it off and get rid of it a little bit. Um, and yeah, like some, some poisons have been known to cause abortions in pregnant mares. Uh, my local vet told me a few stories about some things that were happening a few years ago and she had a lot to do with it because she was the breeding vet. Um, different types of weeds. The most common is uh, glyphosate. Um, what's the other word? <sighs> See, another mind blank, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, the one all over the world, but anyway. It's actually been banned in like heaps and heaps of countries, not Australia yet. It's actually been banned in quite a few states, I think in the US as well. Um, Roundup, that's it, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, that kills everything. So whatever you put it on, it's gonna kill it. But it doesn't all just kill what you put it on. It kills all of your, my, um, your bacteria and your microbiology and your fungi, everything that you've spent how long getting, improving your soil underneath, it's gonna kill that and make your soil sterile. And that, that's why when you kill your weeds and your grasses with that stuff, it, you'll get a bare patch there for quite a long time. It's because it kills everything else in, in, the, in the process. Amicide, um, used to be Amicide 625, they've just changed the dosage of it, so it's Amicide 700. I haven't heard that this is as dangerous as glyphosate, but it's a poison. So, but if I, that's probably the one I used, you know, the most recently as in probably three years ago. Uh, and it's a, what they call a broadleaf killer. So uh, it w won't kill your normal grasses. I think it will kill your buffalo grass because it's a broadleaf grass, but it will kill your most of your woody weeds uh, and any broadleaf weeds, which are lots of them, a fair few of them. So you can literally blanket spray your whole pastures and it will only kill the weeds. But like I said, are we really wanting to do that? Um, so yeah, well there, if I had kept reading down, I would have seen Roundup. I think I've covered everything in there now. Uh, yeah, if you are using wetters help the poison to absorb, uh, I think they say a minimum of four hours before dark or rain to let the, the poison get into the plant. You can use dyes to keep track of where you've been. Um, 
And when I say wet is, you can even use uh, like your dish soap and just put a couple of squirts of that in, it'll help it soak in. And there's also a metzolfuron, which is a little tiny, tiny, tiny pellet. And you only need a tiny amount. I think it's five grams per hundred litres. And if you add that, you, it will also help to kill any, um, like the fertility of the seeds for about three months, I've heard. So I think when that Parthenium comes down the creek, I might have to go back to that, not that I want to. Okay, other methods, and this is more or less what I do. I slash my pastures when the time is right, and that can be a different time each year, depending on what's happening. It doesn't necessarily kill the weeds. It can kill some that aren't real tough, but uh, it gives the grass a bit of a chance to try and come through the weeds if they're thick. And you're also leaving the weeds there so that they can actually do their work on the soil. We've, dis we've discussed the herbicides that I don't use now. Um, and yeah, with, with the slashing, and it's the same as grazing your paddock like we spoke about last week. If you let your cattle or your horses graze it down to two inches or four inches on the top, it's gonna have the same amount of root matter un under the ground. So if that plant was uh, like, uh, half a metre tall and you grazed it down to four centimetres tall that however many <laughs> you could do the sun but you know what I mean that however many centimetres below the ground in root matter will die off because you have the same amount of root matter below as you've got leaf above so that's a good thing uh, with your weeds especially if you've got large taprooted weeds because you it will leave um, space where the root was so that's good space for the oil a uh, soil sorry the air and the water to um, absorb and you know space for it to go into and also the root matter will actually compost down and start adding carbon and compost to your soil so it's a good way of doing it we've got only about seven minutes left so how to manage your weed outbreak I think that says. One of the best ways to do it is to manage your livestock in the paddocks as we spoke about last week, um, rotational grazing and try your best just not to overgraze a paddock. Always leave a layer, um, you know, a minimum of four centimetres of grass height if you can. If you're bringing in feed, either feed it all in the one area, the one paddock, your sacrifice paddock, if you've got a sacrifice paddock, but don't just feed it in a different paddock every week because you're just gonna make yourself a bigger problem. Like I said before, try not to plow, but if you're gonna rip just to open up the soil, I just recently learned at another workshop to what they call rip and drip. So they will have like a drip line behind the tractor with some kind of homemade concoction. And that could be something as simple as uh, molasses and water, um, worm pea mixed in with water, anything like that that's gonna add nutrients to your soil. And that will actually help, because when you open up the soil that, that quickly uh, and let the, the air and the water or moisture in, it wants to take off really, really fast. So the weeds usually come and take off really fast because also it's to do with bacteria and fungal um, pastures. But by adding the drip, you're actually gonna promote more of the, the good bacteria rather than the bad bacteria. So you should have less weeds come up. If you're really keen, you can go out there and plant large tap-rooted plants um, to help decompact because it's gonna leave a huge space. There's like a turnip type thing that's um, I don't know if you can see me, like it's about that long. I think they can get to like half a metre and I see fa some farmers are actually doing that um, to rejuvenate their paddocks. This was taken at my place. Um, the left hand side isn't my place and I'm not having a go at the owner of that because I know the situation they're in, but that paddock was overgrazed. It's only a very small paddock with I think three horses because they only own a small bit of land. Uh, totally grazed down to dirt or grazed down, heavily compacted. Um, when the rains come, it is just 100% solid weed. There is no grass in there whatsoever. My side, that was rotationally grazed and it didn't have horses in there probably for most of the year. The grass in there is, most of it's up around my head height. Um, 
And the only place where I've got weeds in that paddock is actually along that fence line where I've had to go and pull them all out or actually paid someone to pull them out because they got beyond me. So it really makes a difference if you can look after your pastures and not overgraze. I'm rushing now because I want to get to the end. So you can feed your soils. Like I said, the spray, um, you, can, you can make your own concoction like your worm pea mixed with some molasses, mixed with some fish emulsion. Uh, and there was one other thing that I can't remember what it was. I'll have it in my notes somewhere, but you can mix it all up until you can either make it a thicker slurry if you want, or you can actually strain it and just make it into a spray. So it'll come out of a normal sprayer and spray it all over your pastures and it will give them an immediate, immediate, like within 40 minutes boost to um, the quality of the pasture, which will eventually feed down into the root system. Don't sell your horse poo or your cow manure for $5 a bag, keep it on your own land. So you gotta think, you constantly, if you're doing that, you're constantly taking off your land. You need to put back on your own land. So you can either compost it, hot composting, cold composting, whatever, or just my horses, have it all mulched up because they're in the yard every night. So I just scrape it all up and I just spread it onto any of my bare patches. Slash, slash your pasture and leave the cuttings to decompose. The foliar sprays is what I just spoke about and avoid bare ground. Oh, we're at the end and I didn't run out of time. We've got like three minutes left. So if you're interested in having me come out, I've got 40% off of my prices until the end of April if you book before then. Um, yeah, phone consult, a one-off property visit, which I just come out. Um, of course, there's plus uh, travel if you're far away. Uh, or the property consult, which I'll go into a, a lot more detail and I'll send you every kind of bit of information and fact sheets and stuff that I have and come back and do a follow-up um, session again later. And finally, I didn't do this last week, but we've got literally like three minutes. Anyone got any questions? And if we run out of time, you're welcome to send me questions on Facebook. Um, or yeah, Messenger or something like that. Did I put Jane, you... What is like... <laughs> Thanks, Jane, that was good. Um, what did you say the purple weeds were an indicator of? Um, I've been told possibly it could be copper. Um, but when I was looking it up this afternoon, it did say particular plants can be like high nitrate soils or, you know, other things. So it's, if you just Google that um, soil indicator, there was one really good page that came up and it had a list of all these weeds and what they indicated. Um, when I was talking to Shane Craft, he believes the colour is related to the mineral. So sulphur for yellow, he, I think he said copper for blue, um, blue or purple. I think copper is more related to blue, but yeah, I do know um, that's the one I've had the most of. So I'm actually getting a pH soil um, kit as well. I'm going to start doing all that around my place to see what's going on. Cool. Thank you. Jenny, did you get anything out of it? Sorry, did I help? Yeah, I'm spinning. I've been watching. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what no, happened to Fiona. The colour, the colour thing actually really interests me. At um, Mirimbar, we've got, because we have the um, adjustment people there, you know, they just completely flogged out a few of the paddocks and we've yep. just had nothing but those little purple flower weeds come up. Yeah, yeah. It's worth looking it's into. And it can also Sorry? do, it's worth looking into like the colours and stuff and it can also be uh, to do with your pH. Yeah, yeah, no, we will. Yeah, we'll definitely, um, I'll pass information on to my son because he's kind of managing that side of that. I mean, he's, he's, you know, done, you know, what you wouldn't do. He's got out and bought a boom sprayer and he's poisoning yeah. everything. Out. I want um, it, but mine's going to be a lot smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got it hooked on a, on the back of the gator and he just drags it around and then he leaves it and then he slashes it. So he's leaving it there as ground yeah, matter good. anyway. Yeah. Mm. 